this week on the Back Table Podcast. Everything good at Pocket Health has followed from that intuition. Most of the work is execution, proper execution, being patient focused, making sure you're taking the right risks, but not risking yourself too quickly, even when you choose to raise money and everything like that. But at the end of the day, it's all just like literally everything was solved from putting the patient at the center and building an experience that was easy for them to sign up, easy for them to then view their images, easy for them to view their reports and then share with their physician in a way that their physician would actually accept. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable podcast. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and of course on backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. RadPad was developed by physicians for physicians. Clinically proven radiation protection during Cine and digital subtraction angiography. Don't bet your career or your health on anything less. Trust RadPad radiation protection shields for all your fluoro guided interventions. See radpad.com for more information and contact info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and a no brainer radiation protection cap. And don't forget to tell them that you heard about it on the Back Table podcast. Now, back to the show. This is Brian Hartley, as your host this week. I'm a radiologist living in Nashville and co founder of an early stage device company in the imaging space. I'm very excited to introduce our special guest this week, Rishi Nair. Rishi is co-founder and CEO of Pocket Health, the first patient-centric medical image exchange platform. Pocket Health enables patients and healthcare providers to securely access and share medical imaging and diagnostic reports with anyone, anywhere. Pocket Health is being used by more than a million patients in North America and has become an important strategic partner for over 600 hospitals in North America as well with its secure and seamless integration. So with that, welcome Rishi and thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, Brian. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So let's dive in. So I always like to start off just hearing a little bit about yourself, background, kind of family influences that that pushed you into health tech, healthcare, innovation. What made you want to be an entrepreneur? Those types of things. Yeah. um, You know, I grew up in a family of uh, three boys. I'm the middle child. We're um, we're immigrants to Canada. So we immigrated here from India in the uh, in the mid 90s. Both of our parents were in finance, accounting. My older brother uh, went off, became an engineer. I went off to business school after high school. My younger brother uh, went off to become a doctor. So all all three different directions, you know, with pocket health, as you know, the story will will play out. I'm sure in this in this interview, it we all started to intersect back again after after our studies were done. So, you know, I was always interested in entrepreneurship. I love sales. I love building things. Um, all, all of us did. You know, I think we were always looking for that thing that was compelling enough for us to actually go out and take that risk because it is a really big risk, especially when you're in a good career. Hundred percent. And so the passion was there. It seems it sounds like you were just you you wanted to be an entrepreneur. Uh, what about your brother? I guess who was your co-founder as well? Yeah, he was a builder through and through. And then I just love to talk to people. I love to like kind of you know, what we do now is almost like I hone his passion and his energy of what he's building. And he, you know, we build, I think some pretty amazing stuff here at Pocket Elf, but I connected with a market that really needs the solution. I help explain it. And obviously that's a simplification of what we do, but I always think as, you know, he's, he builds it and I, and I help bring it to market and we have a really, it was a perfect overlapping skill set. Um, Venn diagram of skills to to go and and start a startup together on top of being brothers, and you obviously still get along, so that's a good thing. So you're in your backgrounds in business. So uh, where'd you start, and and what made you want to be kind of an entrepreneur? Yeah, I went to I studied business for my undergrad. I went to what else is one of the better business schools in Canada for for that, and I went into what you know a lot of a lot of kids when they don't really know what to do, but I think are smart, got good grades. So what they do is, which is they went into uh, investment banking. So I ended up at Citigroup in their Toronto office in their you know corporate and investment banking division there, and we were I was an analyst there, so bottom of the totem pole, helping senior bankers with like briefing notes and modeling and doing things like that together. And um, it, you know I learned pretty quickly finance isn't. For me, because it's, you know, there's not enough, um, you're not talking, it's very internal facing, 
you're doing a lot of analysis, but you're not able to actually use that analysis yourself. You're supporting others and using it. Uh, I never got to spend a lot of time with clients myself. So mm -hmm. it you was mean like implementing what you're, it, what you're modeling out. Exactly. And the scale that you were operating at, which a lot of people find actually very thrilling, the scale was too big. It, I felt so abstracted away from the value that we were creating, like so many derivatives away. If that makes sense, like I would help someone, you know, do this, do that, do this. And eventually uh, maybe someone gets a loan next year for like a, a basis point or two less than they would have normally. So it's like when you work in a big company, your your impact is so diluted. And I think, I don't know, you could say I have a more, I have a simplistic mind or whatever you want to call it. Like I wanted to see it more directly because I just found it hard to believe it in concept that I was actually my work was helping someone in some way. So it was definitely a driver to leave, to, to go do something that felt more like I could grab, put my arms around it, grab it. All right. So when did this idea come in? When you wanted to put your arms around this one? Yeah. Uh, what, what, how'd it come up and how'd you evaluate it? And what's the story? Yeah. I got a call from my brother. I don't know. This must've been sometime 2015, 14, something around there. He had been playing tennis. He was in Silicon Valley at the time, um, working at at Google, um, and he was playing tennis. He sprained his ankle. His physician said, "Look, this probably is okay, but go get an X-ray, go get an MRI." He did, and at the end of the appointment, they handed him a CD-ROM, and he was kind of flabbergasted. He was a healthy guy; he hadn't really any experience at with the with the medical system, and. And also that juxtaposition, you know, there's Netflix down the road, there's YouTube up the road. And like, this is a really important piece of imaging, a piece of information. And it's on a CD, which was, you know, he had a MacBook Air, he couldn't play it. So he called me and he's like, hey, like we should solve this. And I was a bit, I kind of poo-pooed it. I was like, look, how big of a problem can this be? It's like, I, I was convinced it was just his random imaging center in Sunnyvale, California that was doing this. Like I, I found it. I actually didn't even consider the fact that this is like maybe state of the art in medical imaging at the time. And uh, it, it honestly, across most of America still is. But, you know, he was really persistent and he said, look, like this is this is messed up. Like I'm like we should look into this. We should research it. And, you know, eventually um, over the call, he convinced me and we thought, you know, this could be the entrepreneurial thing that could solve it for us. So, well, help me understand your background was in finance and or investment banking. So you're used to modeling out finances. You could do it with your eyes closed. Now, in this case, one thing I found, especially with physicians, et cetera, is we often go after markets that there's not really a market there. It's just nature. You find a problem that, that you want solved, but maybe it's just something so small that it's not really scalable. How did you look at this problem and say, there's a market there. Like, how did you, how did you validate that? Because I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges that we all have. We all come up with ideas. You know, a lot of people listening are probably innovators and they come up with ideas, but how do you really move it from that stage of, oh, this is a nice to have to, okay, there's a there, there, somebody wants to pay for it or will pay for it. How do you get that kind of affirmation before you just totally dive headfirst into it. Yeah, it's super important. I think in like the free money times of the last, you know, 10 years minus the one year, I encountered so many founders who, you know, what I would say were had solutions looking for problems, like they built something cool and they personally found it cool. And then they were like, how can I like finagle the market to like make them want to buy it when that's like actually just look, you're starting from scratch. You might as well build a solution where the market already wants it. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, you get to build your, you know, if you're building a house from scratch, you get to pick the land. There's no sunk cost there. So anyways, to answer your question, we were, we were hyper-focused on this one. It's like, is it something that the market is, does the problem exist? And then is the solution something that the market would bear? The problem existing was really easy to validate. We literally called about a hundred or so clinics and hospitals. We just said, we made up a story. We said, Hey, look, we want to send our mom for like an MRI as like to just check something. We can get a referral, but I, you know, as her son, I want to be able to get access to it afterwards just for my own records. And how do I get that? And then they said CD every single place, like from Mayo clinic down to like the random clinic, uh, down, down the street. 
CD. And, the, you know, we would press them. Say, okay, okay, but I don't have a CD-ROM drive. Could you email it to me? No, 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 no. So so we were like, cool, everyone's burning CDs. One, that's embarrassing for the industry overall. And we can get it, get into that and why this problem hasn't been solved. But, and I think embarrassing is the right word because this has been, file sharing has been solved in every other industry. So anyways, so there was that, but then it was like, okay, is the solution the right solution? Right? So from that perspective, we actually felt we were pretty validated because we were like, we are the end users. We're like, what is the solution is like how we receive files every day. How does someone Dropbox a file over, over to me? Or how does someone airdrop something? Or we were like, we know, once we know that everyone is burning CDs, we kind of intuitively knew what the right solution was, which is like, hey, it's it's patient centric, meaning like we didn't even consider the thought of like pushing it just directly from hospital to hospital. We were like, no, 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 I want it as a patient, like a CD, right? And then I can deliver it to wherever I need to go. And that just made sense. And honestly, now eight years out, million patients, we haven't pivoted like once, even slightly. The idea is like literally exactly the same. And the clinical need has remained the same. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, um, we were worried about the problem because the problem, like we, neither of us had any healthcare background at all. But once we knew the problem existed, we were like, the solution is obvious. And we kind of went down that path and been running since then. I love that idea that you, that you called a hundred hospitals, you know, that's, that is probably the next step that a lot of early first time founders don't do. And because I think it's a little uncomfortable um Every, to to do that everybody uh, wants to play startup right yes like it's fun you know it is I, I i i you know what if someone came up to me and, and then i'm they they know the name of their startup before they know what they're building they've got the domain name before they know what they're building they've got their logo before they know what they're building and how they're building it before they've called a potential customer they're doomed like they're just screwed i just know it because they're what it tells me is their instinct was the cool stuff the cool stuff about building a company, the fun stuff about building a company, that was their instinct. And they needed to get to the, you know, you need that instinct to get the hard stuff done first, because otherwise, like, you know, you're tested on this prioritization exercise over and over and over again, like constantly. So you'll never make it if you always just want to talk to the customer who already likes you. It'll just never work out. So. No, I, I think that's totally right. And I, I it, you know, it stems from also going back to solutions, looking for problems and, um, that you're, you are going to have a very hard time finding product market fit. If you never really dig in to find out what the customer truly wants. And I think you did guys, obviously you did the right thing. I mean, whose idea was it to be like, we got, we got to validate this and call, call a hundred folks. A me more, uh, my brother, we have different personalities. He has like this passion and almost like irrational confidence which actually is very very useful when you're building a startup because you know the odds are always against you so you sort of need to be a bit delusional no, you've um, got to be delusional yeah. you have to be 100 so, percent. otherwise you'd stop you, you yeah. look at the odds and you'd stop he was like let's just start building it like honestly while while i was calling he's just he's tinkering in the background trying to make our first front end only prototype and and things like that so back then like figma and stuff didn't exist so he was like actually coding it but so it's a uh, you know, I, it was my idea and, you know, at the end of it, he's like, see, I told you so, right? Like, he's like, you didn't have to do all that work. And yeah. Calls. <laughs> <laughs> the irony. Yeah. I mean, that's just so funny. It's yeah. like, okay, all right. Yeah, no. Well, uh, 98 times out of 100, that, that ends with there's no there there, you know, but there you go. So how did you validate? So, so you, to me, you validated the need. So the need is there. People, people want it. But I, I didn't hear in there anywhere that said somebody would pay for this. And that to me is the real zero to one is, of course, there's a need there. I mean, we always talk about that in physicians. We're like, this is the stupidest thing ever that we have CDs. And my wife literally hurt her foot and she went to two different physicians. And the, the second one was like, oh, I can't take this USB drive that you have. And they were like, this is absurd. She's basically like, and there was imaging on it that really was critical. Like I'm a radiologist. So I looked at her imaging and I knew that she had a fracture in one spot. She went to another physician who did their own imaging. You couldn't see the fracture because they didn't do a specific view. 
And he was like, I don't think there's a fracture there. And I'm like, you fool, there is a fracture. Like I've got this image that shows it and anybody would call it a fracture. Anybody, any radiologist. And, but he didn't have it. So that affected care right there. And it just, be, it's so frustrating. So the need, it, it, it's, it's insane, right? It's embarrassing. You said that. But how did you come up with who was going to pay for it? Because that is probably problem number two that early, fo- early founders do not figure out, especially in healthcare. Yes. Who's going to pay for especially, it? How are you going to build a business? Especially when they're VC back, you don't have to worry about it for a while. So we were not. We purposefully started our business where we thought we would never, ever raise venture capital. We didn't even consider what we were doing really a startup. We thought we were starting a, a business. Our logic was like, look, if we can like pay ourselves just our, like, you know, what we were making before, we were like, that's a win. That's like an amazing outcome. Because we're like, hey, you're Lily Lace the Dream. You're running your own business. You're your own boss. Yeah, yeah. You're making revenue, and you can pay yourselves. Nothing crazy, but you know that that's so, so. That's the and I think that that context is important because that's the lens that we were. So meaning we had to have a paying customer right from the beginning. So our you know first we thought we could charge hospitals and clinics. We went to them and they said, look, like who are you guys? Like you're literally you know it's two guys in a condo. So and like, you know, hey, yeah, we obviously don't like CDs, but we're not going to give it to like, again, two guys with a prototype. We don't really have budget, things like that. So we were like, okay, what if we, what if we ask the patient to pay? They're already driving to pick up the CD, paying for parking. So like they're significantly in the hole just to get the, the CD. And sometimes they pay a fee for the CD. Let's just assume they don't. But anyways, they're significantly in the hole just from that. And then they have to drop off the CD at their, you know, their surgeon's office or whatever. So that's like several hours of time. So we were like, look, why don't we just charge them, charge the patient a fee? And if anyone can afford it, we'll let them call us and we'll waive the fee for them over the phone. And even if they stop paying us, let's make it that we store their images forever. So we were like, that's, that was an important concept. We were like, you can always access your records forever, even if you stop paying. At any point. That's huge. Is it a subscription model? It is a subscription model. So patients pay either $10 a month or $49 a year. And that includes all of their imaging records stored permanently and for their entire family as well. So, oh, well, that's really, that's really, I imagine that is really important for patients who have chronic illness. But there's a ton of patients in this country who have chronic illness and are probably always looking for, you know, maybe there's a different doctor out there or different provider. And if you're constantly going back and forth, I mean, it's just a huge pain. Also, I know I have imaging from back in college, you know, where's that gone? I'll never see that again. No, it's definitely deleted. It's definitely, you know, it's gone. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And you know how important as we say in radiology, old is gold. Yeah. That's what we say. That's the phrase. Old is gold. So your, your prior exam, is probably the most important thing that I could ever have next to clinical history. Honestly, many times I'd probably rather have a prior exam than know why you come in if you order, yeah. if you have a study. That's critical. And, you know, now with so much imaging moving into the cloud, these hospitals are finally having to pay for each incremental bit of storage. Um, whereas before, you know, it's kind of a sunk cost. You already have the data center, et cetera. So you're finding the rate of deletion is much higher. Uh, they're obviously still legally compliant, you know, keeping it for the, whatever it happens, seven years, longer if it's longer, if it's pediatric, but et, et cetera. So they're, so you're finding that you're losing these things quicker, but patients intuitively know this. So like back to like, how did we, how do we verify this? We literally just went to our first clinic that we begged and pleaded, said, look, this thing costs you nothing. And if no patient signs up, we make zero revenue. So like we're completely aligned here and you can still burn CDs if you want. So like there's literally no downside at all. So this one clinic, um, one imaging center, they just did x-ray and ultrasound, not even any advanced imaging. They let us put up some posters and it was slow going, you know, in a week we'd have maybe one or two patients sign up, but it was, you know, it was very exciting. We're like, oh, we made oh, like, heck yeah. yeah, we made that like, mean, that's proving there's a there. Yeah. There, so right? we were like, you know, that we were like, so pretty quickly we started doing some math. We were like, okay, if our posters get better and the solution gets better, and then we go from one clinic to 50 clinics and so on and so forth. We're like, okay, we can like survive. This is like a, there's something here. And then, and then, you know, we just went from ho- clinic to hospital and, and so on, just saying, look, like this is, 
a no downside scenario. Even our contracts, our contracts to this day are like, turn this off whenever you feel like. And obviously in eight years, not a single hospital has ever left us out of hundreds because you know we're, we're like, we're completely aligned here. If a patient doesn't find value in this, they will go and ask you for a CD. But trust me, they won't because their time is worth more than, you know, the 10 bucks and anyone that can't afford it, they call, we waive the fee for them over the phone. We've worked hard and gotten the entire platform um, eligible for HSA, FSA reimbursement as well. So at the end of the day, you know, not that many people are paying out of their pocket regardless, but most importantly, the hospital is not paying anything. Um, the well, that's huge. System. And it's so hard these days to get the hospital to do anything. I mean, they're just like, they're, they've are they got a shield up because they're so used to being bombarded with with companies who have the next new thing or, or whatever. And they're paying um, for this now. Like they're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for image exchange software that doesn't work. What do they use? What, what are the, what, what's out there now? How did we get here? That's what I want to know. How did we end up here? You know? The, um, the story was basically... People like to control things in healthcare and they forget that the patient's there. Um, it sounds a bit glib to say, but it's it's relevant to the whole story. So, you know, I need to get, like, I'm like a, if I'm like a radiology administrator, maybe in like 2005, I'm burning CDs. Why am I burning CDs? I'm burning it because the orthopedic surgeon is asking for it. So the patient comes, picks up the CD and delivers it to the orthopedic surgeon. So then my solution is, what if I could just give it directly to the orthopedic surgeon? That, that, that kind of sounds logical. So I, I imagine like thousands of people having that thinking, and then all of a sudden people are like, okay, well, I can digitally solve that. Let me create a network. Let me make it that you can, that you can have a portal that that orthopedic surgeon signs into, and then they can see all their images. Now, what you're accidentally building is like an opt-in file sharing network. Your, your, yeah, like a hub and spoke model. So that happened and is today. And if you look at like basically every image exchange software besides Pocket All, that's how they operate hub and spoke. It's a network. You need to well, sign up. The hub up. is the hospital. Exactly. And the spoke is everybody else. When in reality, you guys are making the hub the patient. Exactly. And so the, you know, that the spokes go wherever the patient wants it to go. It, exactly. And it's not genuinely, it, it boggles the mind why, why we were the first ones to achieve scale in this model. It boggles the mind because it's not like we're doing it because it's better for the patient, which it is, or the patient wants, it's more like, you know, that it's morally correct. It is, you know, it's none of those reasons, even though those happen to be true. It's literally the, when you kind of cr draft the data diagram, it's the more efficient way for the information to flow because like there's way more orthopedic surgeons endpoints that you need to add. Like the, it's an intractable problem. You could trying never to connect. go. It, it's yeah. impossible. It's yeah. impossible. And it's really, it's up to the patient who they want to connect yeah. to. And they're not in control of that. You know, the, the network is not in control of that. Exactly. And that's why the CD worked well, because the CD was simple. You handed it to the patient who didn't need to be tech savvy. They never even need, needed to put in that CD anywhere and look at it. And they just delivered it. And, you know, they obviously there's a lot of issues with the CD that we don't have to repeat because they're obvious, but scratches, but problems, yeah, yeah, everything else. You can't yeah. load them. No one has a no CD viewer drive. anywhere. Yeah. Exactly. But the general concept was correct. So you now have like people wondering, well, hey, I'm paying like $250,000 a year to like Microsoft or, 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 or something to, to handle this file sharing problem. But I'm burning as many CDs as I did before. And why? Uh, and then they they try to put an image in their patient portal and say, well, that'll solve the problem. Well, it doesn't because patients don't want to just look at a picture of their chest. They don't care. They want the diagnostic quality access for their physician in a way that the physician will actually accept. And no radiologist is going through and accepting, accepting a MyChart link getting ex exposed to all of your other clinical history just for like a non-diagnostic image with a viewer that they can't window and et cetera on. Like, so it's like, like, I, I just felt like being outsiders to the industry was such a boon to us because we would just kind of walked in and we didn't have to like discover the issues with the existing solutions. They were like painfully obvious and then we could build it. And then with the patient being our customer, like literally the, the one hold, holding us up that we can, can, support ourselves on, we were able to build something that they found a ton of value in. 
So a, there's a concept of like knowing enough to be dangerous. And I've always thought that, you know, the best combination for a startup, and now maybe I'm just saying this out loud because you're right here, is the best combination is having somebody who knows enough to be dangerous, but also a technical person who knows everything about potential solutions, right? And when you see, when you have somebody who looks from the outside, they don't, they don't just accept that this is the way it is, right? When we all, grew, we, I've, I've just been born into this system. You just accept that this is how it is. So there's something to having that, that external perception of somebody that can be like, wait a minute, I know what you're saying. I know how you're saying it works right now. And it makes no sense whatsoever that you do this. In healthcare, that's an extra advantage even. So what you said is an advantage in most uh, startups trying to disrupt sleepy industries. In healthcare, it's an extra advantage because this almost like naivete or lack of understanding of the industry is also the patient's view because most patients walk in and they don't accept the CD. They're surprised. Even in, in 2005, they were surprised. Like they were like, whoa, a CD. Oh, I haven't seen one of these in a couple of years. Like this wasn't a, you know, it's not like they accepted it. The only people that did accept it were the people who actually lived in the system. So not only were we able to go in and say, look, why, why are these legacy image exchanges based on this antiquated portal idea or this antiquated hub and spoke model of data sharing? But we also were able to like, literally think how a patient would think in that situation and say, okay, well, what would they expect? Okay, well, they're used to, they're used to like Instacart and Uber where like something instantly arrives. They're used to like a, a native app experience. They're used to this and that, like they're, they're used to like, you know, you look at your banking and the bank doesn't hide information for you. They pull insights from this huge amount of data in your bank account. And so it's, it, it, you know, these things you can just kind of pull together into a product that is much more intuitive really quickly compared to what someone from the inside would be able to do. Totally. And that, you've said something before that I wanted to circle back to. You mentioned, are hospitals really pay, paying all that money for these networks to share images? I mean, what net, what, what net, you said Microsoft, et cetera. So what are, what is this? That's, that's not your PAC system, is it? Or some of your PAC system, like Change Healthcare has one, Microsoft has one, um, Intellirad has one. There's, um, a bunch of little guys um, without a lot of market share, but, you know, trying to, trying to find a, a space in this market, but it's not cheap. You're sometimes paying a buck, two bucks, three bucks a study to transfer it after. And, you know, I think where reimbursements are, that's not really tenable, but what's the other solution? Burning CDs. It's not the cost of the CD. You have like a workforce that's, that's, um, you know, of people making, uh, especially, you know, good money these days, burning CDs and, paying for things. And then at the end of the day, you, um, you know, you don't, you don't realize that you have an opportunity here to, to not just share images with your patients, but you can use that to keep your patients sticky, right? So you can think about the lost revenue opportunity, what you could be using when you engage a patient really deeply, teach them about their healthcare, as opposed to just handing them a CD-ROM or giving them a link to a, a portal where they, you know, it's really difficult for them to log in they have to fax access over, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. well, can you tell me technically how does how does this work? Why did why did you guys figure this out and nobody else did? I mean, obviously you've got a you've got a genius like technical co founder, but is that it or was it you know where where did you guys go right that everybody else was like oh we missed it? Well, I think the biggest intuition was put the patient at the center and build them a solution that they would expect outside of healthcare. Everything good at Pocket Health has followed from that intuition. Obviously there's like, most of the work is execution, proper execution, being patient focused, making sure you're taking the right risks but not risking yourself too quickly, even when you choose to raise money and everything like that. But at the end of the day, it's all just, like literally everything was solved from putting the patient at the center and building an experience that was easy for them to sign up, easy for them to then view their images, easy for them to view their re uh, their reports, and then share with their physician in a way that their physician would actually accept. And we were just hyper focused on this one problem. Even now, you know, we're over a hundred people, and all we focus on is this. We don't do packs, we don't do risks, we don't do VNA, we don't do like 
anonymization or like anything else, like we don't do, um, we're not building AI on the side that can detect, you know, strokes and, and triage and et cetera. Like we're literally just trying to solve image exchange, a hundred people just trying to solve that. So it's, you can imagine like the nuance and the attention each button gets and w w when you, when you have that and it just, it's yeah. And it just leads to a better solution and everyone else was just doing Having it. They yeah. were building a, a bigger network. And when you're building a bigger network, when you, you know, it's all, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. It's like, you can look at like, um, simple things like, uh, there's been acquisitions recently where they've been trying to consolidate networks, life image being acquired, for example, like the solution to like, you know, when your network's not working, you know, your clients are still burning CDs. Don't build a bigger network. The, yeah. They're literally like in the boardroom and are like, you know what the problem is? Yeah. Our network's More not, network. Yeah, our network's <laughs> not big enough. That's the problem. And yeah. it's like, guys, there's like an architecture thing. And like adding, you know, having a poster at like, you know, RSNA or something being like, we're patient centric or now we have a patient portal and things like that. If the fundamental data flow doesn't change, right? Even like your economic model, like who is your main customer, everything like that doesn't change. Like you won't be able to build in that way. And and that's fine. Like, you know, you, you need to be able to, it just means that like, you'll never properly solve image exchange. You can build a great packs that way. You can build a great risk, a great workflow solution and things like that. Like that's the right thinking for all of those problems, which are really important problems to solve. But in image exchange in our thesis, which I think we've proven out is it, it can only be solved in the patient centric model. Like literally only there's not another option period. If you buy that premise, which we do, it can only be solved in that model. There's only one way to think about it. And which means that these legacy networks will never work because you will never get all of, uh, you know, the United States, all of North America on one platform. And even as you push towards interoperability, we're, we're very, very, very far from these systems to be able to actually push at scale into each other outside of like a walled garden proof of concept, because also these these systems are not economically incentivized to even permit that activity, despite what you can press release about. So you can only work in in systems and I guess imaging centers where they accept your images, where you guys can communicate directly with their packs. Is that correct? That's correct. We, you know, we we deploy locally at a hospital, so we're integrated inside their pack system. So you know, we're we're deployed there. We need some. It doesn't actually. It doesn't have to be a local deployment, but we do have to have some connectivity with their packs to be able to, when a patient requests access, be able to query that packs for the imaging and then send it up to the patient. So do you have to communicate with all these different packs? Do you have to have APIs that that just talk with all of them? And not just the packs. Packs is where you get the images and sometimes mm -hmm. the reports, but not always. You know, you can get the reports from tons of different places. So we, you know, we're we're deploying um, on top of EMR. Sometimes we're talking to to the transcription. Sometimes we're integrating um, into the my chart, for example. Uh, so there's a single sign on for the patient because a lot of hospitals they love Pocket Health, but they don't want the patient to sign up for a different thing. They're like, can we just can we just do a handshake and single sign on through the my chart, which we're which we're happy to do. So there's the integration gets um, you know complex on our end. We try to keep it simple for on the health systems end, which I think we've done a really good job with, but it gets complicated pretty quickly. So do these reports go into like an Epic or something like that? At, at, whenever you have that handshake, say you want to go see a new provider, you bring your images in, you're on Pocket Health, you go in and do you have to do something at this point to get your images to show up in that provider's medical yeah, EMR you have to, uh, you have and to share images show up in packs. Yeah, you have to share it with them. So you'll go into your, into Pocket Health, you'll click share, and then you can share it directly with your provider. Now, your provider might just want to look at them just for looking at them, like a, a quick reference. Yeah, or on their computer, on their iPad. So they'll just look at it. It's a full diagnostic viewer. They can go, they can scroll. It might just be for validation. Can you share it with them as an individual provider? Like, like if I was just an orthopedic surgeon, I had my standalone, but I don't have your system. Can I just log in and be like, you know, you give me access to your images that way? That's the entire point. There's no logging in. Think of it as like, think of it as like, like we could, let's go back to like a file sharing system that we think our patients will be used to using like Google drive or Dropbox. If I was sharing a picture with you, Brian, I wouldn't worry, like, does Brian know what Google Drive is or has he ever used Dropbox before? It's literally a link. So 
you only have access to that link. Yeah, so you only an have orthopedic access surgeon would get a link and he would just click on it and be like, oh, let me open it. It leads yeah. me to the viewer. Or I can look at your images now. Now, the cool thing is like a lot of times that orthopedic surgeon doesn't use email. So our platform kind of like has these, you could say like modern principles of like one-to-one -one sharing and instant sharing and things like that. But then we also bring it back to the, to the, to the state of the art in, in healthcare. So the patient, for example, can actually fax that link over to the referring physician. It's, it's really funny, but it's, it's literally one of the most popular ways of sharing on the platform. Yeah. They, they put is, is a report. I imagine like faxing a report or something. Kind of, but it's like, imagine it says like, Hey, you know, Dr. Hartley, this is Rishi Nair's imaging, go to pocketout.com and put in this code. And then here's a QR code as well. And then you can view everything in full diagnostic quality. Um, awesome. So it's it's really That's, like it's like going backwards. The to way go I forwards. the way I describe it, it's almost like you have this like 4K or 8K TV, mm -hmm. but it needs an antenna or something. Yeah, it's <laughs> almost like it's cherry rigged to like a VHS tape, and the patient just has to just has to pop in the VHS and and you know at the other end you're getting this 8K visual. But we had to do a lot of like gluing together of systems. But you know that's a common issue that health tech founders run into is they're like. Like imagine it was just the link, the email link, and you click on it and you see the full CT and full diagnostic quality. But then the, you know, the orthopedic surgeon is not using it. A lot of founders- And also he's not going to give out his email. I mean, I don't yeah, say no, this, they but won't. there's but probably they a won't. lot of physicians like, I don't want to give won't. my email out to everybody. And they throw up their hands and say, oh, this physician's so dumb. Oh, they're so, uh, they're not tech savvy. They're anti-change. And it's like, guys- they're seeing like 80 patients a day or something. And, you know, yeah, fine. They're looking at imaging. They're also looking at the labs, looking at all this other stuff. They're also talking to the patient. It's just one input. And you want them to sign up for your like, like, you know, your, your Intellirad portal or something like that when they have, then they got to go to another portal for this other thing and stuff. They just want the CD. They just want the CD. It works so easily. They don't even put it into the computer. Their assistant puts it into the computer for them. They just walk into the room and it's on the screen. Like you need to create a better experience of that. I can't create a worse experience and then tell the orthopedic surgeon, but it's digital, like it's better. And they're like, it's literally worse. Like it's literally worse. So no wonder your image exchange isn't working because you're, it's like you say in healthcare, sorry, in, in, in tech for there to be a change, you need to be 10 X better. That's kind of like the threshold for change. It can't be like 0 0.8 X, you know, worse. Like, you know, you can't like it. So it's, so it's, uh, I don't know. I'm a bit on my soapbox now, but it, it all, all these, all these topics link together where, you know, you just need to, you need to build something really cool that people want and then bring it down to the reality of like, Will people click this button? Okay, then will they click that button? Everything is a funnel and you just need to figure that out and look at all the roadblocks along the way. Love it. Now, last topic I want to get into here is, you know, my brain is leading up to this interview. My brain just keeps going. It goes into founder mode and it looks at what can you do? What can you do with this now that you have built this platform? And it sounded, my brain has shifted from this is so simple. Like I had this idea seven years ago, obviously, but no, 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 no. Unless you go down the pathway of solving it and truly solve it, you don't see what it could truly become. Because at the beginning, when I first look at this problem, like it's a, it's kind of a, you know, okay, it's not that, it's, a, it's an obvious problem, right? Let's just call it what it is. It's an obvious problem. But now that my brain is wrapping around what you guys have done, I start asking more positive questions like, what can we do with this now that we have this? What we you know, where, where does it go from here? And I love that you guys are staying focused. hundred people still working on, you know, patient experience uh, and, and making it work. But my brain cannot help but go to, okay, you know, what if a patient wants a second opinion on some of those images? Because one idea I've always had is, you know, there so many patients get a finding and it says, you know, this is means X, Y, and Z, or you need to do this. And they say, ah, is this really true? Is there a service where you could say, hey, I have your images now. You sign up for this second opinion service. You send it to, a, you know, an, an expert in, you know, brain MRI. And he only looks at that finding and says, yeah, this is exactly, I'd do the same thing. Or no, maybe you should go see, you know, this doctor because maybe I would have read it a little bit differently. So your my point is you're creating this platform that now makes your your imaging data much more portable and owned by the patient. I think you you use digital assets. I like that word. But 
I can't help but think how do you, if you're going to keep the patient centric mode, uh, you know, idea, and if that is your true kind of driving core mission, then where do you go next? Like, how do you, how do you use that? Because my brain automatically wants to do a whole bunch of things with this. Yeah. I think when we think about product development, there's two key priorities. Number one, the table stakes is make the image exchange functionality so powerful, so good, so cheap that, that, a, yeah. And, and, and a healthcare system will always want to use it and will never turn it off that they will never use. So, you know, a huge part of our R and D just goes into like seamless record exchange. So these healthcare systems are like, this is better than anything else on the market. It's also weirdly cheaper than anything else on the market. And, um, we just want to deploy it and be thrilled with the service. That, that's table stakes. That's like, that's like making sure that 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 we continue to to grow and solve this i'd say like v1 problem which is a cd it's should the never, most important yeah. thing you can do to yeah be honest, it's the most important it's it's the most important thing you can do yeah so you know now that we have that on such a you know we're innovating so fast that i feel really strong about our ability to do that then you get to think about okay so you have these million patients on the platform and they're coming on board you know what do they want next? What do they want? Yeah, 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 exactly. So, you know, I kind of view it as like there's first there's like understanding or education, then there's confirmation. So education is really do they actually understand what their records mean? And that's a really cool area to go into. You know, we launched this functionality called Report Reader about a year ago, where you go into the report, and this is live across our entire patient base. You go into the report, and all of the language is highlighted, and you can click on it and translates those words for you into patient-friendly language. So these patients are actually understanding their reports for the first time. So you can imagine you know, us going deeper down that rabbit hole, which we're continuing to do where the patients can finally leave. And, you know, we're working on stuff like inserting next steps and questions to ask your physician. This is really, really useful where we're based on this report. Like Matt, the way I think about it is like, sorry, just to back up for a second, the, the experience I want is, you know, as a fairly privileged person, privileged meaning I'm Indian. So everyone I know is a doctor. So I can literally any, my, you know, I'll stub my toe and I can call someone and be like, what do you think about this toe stub? And yeah, 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 exactly. So, so, and it's, it, it, it gives you so much control. Okay. I'm, I have my call with my doctor. What should I ask them? So we were like, can we deliver that experience to people in an automated way? So anyways, you can, you know, you can imagine um, things we're working on is like being able to say what's next and what I should ask my physician. I, a note taking built in there, but all based and customized on the report that we already have. And I think critically, and a lot of vendors in this generative AI mode, we've been are forgetting this, keeping the data on platform and not contributing it to some mass AGI effort. So that's just something that if you're ever using a patient portal and you see an AI button, definitely question where is that data going? Did I get permission to that? And is it contributing to some larger corpus of data that I did not give permission for? Anyways, sidebar, uh, yeah, sidebar warning. So anyways, that that's something that we care a lot about and want to make sure that we will always be able to do things um, in-house in that way. So anyways, and then, so that's education. A lot of, like we could spend years on education. We're also thinking about confirmation. Confirmation, Brian, is what you said. Okay, I understand what this record means, but like, can I talk to someone else about it? Can I get someone else to look at it? You know, you know, the, the stats vary, but, uh, in terms of our sharing, but you know, something like one fifth of our shares go towards a second opinion on the platform. So it's like, it's like, um, really it's an important use case. And I just want to make sure that the second opinion is to a rad that's better than the one who gave the first opinion, because that's often not the case often the second opinion is happening by a rad who is a general rad or and not subspecialized maybe not even in the country and that's not doing the patient a service you know so 100 percent. you basically yeah. need a network of consultant rads basically who are just specialists within a region and you refer to them and you maybe they get paid something because obviously you're gonna have to pay for it if you're a patient and they get a small fee but maybe they don't read the whole exam they just read the finding and say, you know what? To me, what I see, there's so much medical waste out there, okay, Rishi? There's so much imaging that is unnecessary that many rads, you know, I do it too. I'm guilty. 
you you know you recommend to follow up because you're not 100 percent sure of something right that's just you want what's best for the patient in that moment you also don't want to get sued okay and so if you have somebody who's like totally the best specialist in that area and they can confidently say this does not require a follow-up or something along those lines you've just saved the patient a scan you've maybe saved insurance money uh by doing that as well that's a powerful alignment of incentives um, that I've just always wanted to see happen is this kind of a second opinion, easy kind of second opinion service. And I think you guys are perfectly positioning, positioned for something like that. Yeah. And we talk to our, our health systems because we have to, because they give the first opinion. So, you know, even as we generally start to think about concepts like this, we want to make sure they're comfortable with it. Yeah, because you don't want to piss them off and exactly. be like, oh, and you just, this radiologist is now pissed. We don't exactly. want to use your and, service. And the really interesting thing is, you know, the, the health systems, I think they're at a point where with so much patient access to data, they, they're they like, look, this is happening already. So I'd rather it's it's done by a subspecialized rad and not someone in a, in a foreign country and et cetera. And two, they view it as almost like free QA. They're like, look, on uh, catching things, catching things early, you know, it, the liability comes in when you catch something late. Right. So if you catch something early, it's like no harm, no foul. You remove ego from it and it's only a good thing. Yeah. So that's, th- that's probably what you have to manage as egos. Yeah. So, you know, we're not the physicians ever have any ego whatsoever. No, no, no. Not, not that I've encountered. None so. that you know. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So awesome. Well, look, uh, let, let's, let's wrap it up with some. Do you have any advice for budding entrepreneurs? What have you learned in going from your corporate, you know, I banking job to, to successful startup like what do you what, what, what's the one thing that you're just like all right i would do this or this is what i've learned yeah s- stay humble pick a problem that you can grind at and you don't mind like actually grind like just and it's not glamorous so imagine you're like literally getting no glory for it you have to meet customers every single day in dingy coffee shops just to like convince one in a hundred to let you you know install your software and Can you go home at the end of that day and be like, oh, this is a really cool problem. I made like 0.0001% progress towards it. And it was a great day. And for a lot of people, that answer for their problem will be yes. And then you should definitely go for it. And uh, it's just looking back, it happens really, really slowly. And then all at once. So it's- I love that. That, That's the the way I've seen it again and again and again. It's like those visuals where- you know, you're, you, you make zero progress for years and years and years. And then for all of a sudden the hockey stick starts. Um, and then people, there's that, that cartoon that shows right before the hockey stick starts, that shows like, this is never going to work. I give up. Right. That's, that's where they, that's where they give up a lot of times. Um, and you also see it as you're not making any progress, right? You, you, you don't see the needle move, but in reality, you're learning at, you are building value into yourself and your business. It just takes time before you have that like insight or that customer hits until you really start hitting the inflection point. Yeah. You have to just celebrate the small wins and a weird bit of advice that I believe in, maybe it doesn't work for everyone is don't look too far ahead. Don't plan because if you look too far ahead, then you set your goal at, you know, years away and then your progress today as a percentage of that goal is actually very small. If you set your goal, it's just like two months away. All of a sudden, that one day of progress could have been actually pretty significant. So it's just these these psychology tricks too, because being you know being a founder is kind of messes with your head a, a bit. So you have to manage your own psyche on this journey, and you never really learn you're 100%, that anywhere. So. And you're also describing every physician that goes through medicine because you can't look. You, you, if looking back down the mountain from where I started, I'm just like, oh my God, if I knew that's what I had to do, holy crap. I don't yeah, know if I would have done it. You were just like, okay, let me write my MCAT. Yeah, Correct. And, let me, and, let's, and let's, yeah. do, let's do the MCAT. Let's, let's get through this one surgery rotation or this one, you know, OB rotation. Sorry. And you know, that's, you, you just got to, just got to make it through this one thing. And then that's a success at the end. You celebrate and you're happy, but you move on to the next thing. But yeah. you don't say, oh my God. But yeah. When I get done with that, I've got you six guys more years it. of training. Yeah, like I've got six. My um, my our younger brother is an internist, um, and he's working at a, a hospital here in Toronto, and very accomplished. And but I, I, I think I'm like well, that's a lot of to be a subspecialized. You know, it's it's a lot of training. So. Uh, I don't know how you how you guys do it, but I'm grateful we have people like that. It's exactly so, what you yeah. said. I think I think you just keep your head down from one one small project or or whatever it is to the next. Otherwise, you you just oh, I'm, you, you get dizzy just looking back. 
Um, but all right, I th- this was awesome. So let me run through a quick summary. It may or may not make sense, but I want you to jump in and tell me if there's anything to add, okay? So number one, entrepreneurs have the opportunity to make an immediate and visible impact. This can be very attractive, especially to folks who are used to working on big pie-in-the-sky problems where they're so far removed from the the impact that they're making that they don't get as much joy out of it, you, a la you and iBanking. And I think that's just important for everyone to know. It's like you're in charge of your own destiny, and that is that's a that is a good thing a lot of times. I mean, it's a bad thing sometimes, but it's a good thing. So a common problem for first-time founders, it's a solution looking for a problem. So how can, or how can I change the market to uh, to to just just want to buy my my device or my service? But that's not the way it works. You really got to start at the foundation. Uh, you guys called a hundred hospitals. Uh, you know, made up a story. I love that. That's one of my favorite parts of this entire story is that you guys you, you go out there and you you had to prove that there was a there there, right? And you had to prove that everyone really had CDs. You didn't know that. You ask a physician, they're going to tell you, yes, everybody has CDs. <laughs> but you you needed to hear it for yourself. You've got to believe, right? And you had to do it. And it also probably made you learn a ton about how these offices think about image sharing. So instinct was the fun stuff about building the company. You know, you, you, we've talked about, you talked about how founders will often just like, oh, I got my new company, my logo, I'm, 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 I'm ready to go. But they haven't really vetted the need yet and that is the you know similar to what we were just saying you've got to make sure there's a there there uh before you just dive in why because you have to be a little delusional to to start a startup the odds are so against you um you know it's okay to be a little delusional right but at the beginning you better be clear-eyed about the problem you're solving and and the need that you're solving so next who's gonna pay i I just this one comes up again and again, and it's really tough for physicians to wrap their heads around. But you've got to know who's going to pay and why they're going to pay. Because if you don't, you're just you're just saying I, this is a problem for me, and I think it's a you know I think it's a real problem. But maybe it's just a nice to have, not a must have. So that's really important to uh, to know. And you guys, it sounds like you lowered the activation energy to drive adoption. You made it as easy as possible to get this thing adopted because you knew. You got it. You had to start. How you started. You had to start having those kind of network effects almost um, before it would go. And you guys worked hard to do that. Know enough to be dangerous. We talked about how naivete was a good thing early on because not knowing the healthcare system means you're not accustomed to all these crazy things that we do. And you can look at it and say, "Wait a minute, we have Uber and all and Netflix with all these movies in the cloud, and I can't get my images from Doctor A to Doctor B." So that I can get the best care that for me, that's insane. And so you said it. You said it like that's insane, and 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 that's where it was born. Uh, what else we have here? We got uh, put the. This is probably the most important thing. Put the patient at the center and build something they would expect outside of healthcare. Like that instantaneous kind of Uber level of workflow. If you keep your brain set on those types of things, you're gonna have a product, especially if you know the patient wants it. Keep this as your core principle. You'll always be going in the right direction. I love this. You brought this in the end. Pick a problem you can grind at and don't mind to keep going even when it doesn't look like you're making progress. Uh, I cannot agree with this uh, enough. You better be obsessive. I think the word is probably obsessive. I think you have to be delusional a little bit, like you said, but you need to be obsessive more than anything else. And even tiny little progress amounts should make you excited. Otherwise, the road is just way too long and hard. You know, you kind of need to recognize that in yourself. And then finally, uh, don't look too far ahead. Set your goal. You know, don't set your goal at years and years away uh, because you won't see that progress, right? And 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 you'll start to be worn down. So make small goals that you can celebrate, right? The small wins. When you guys got ten bucks in revenue, you were probably popping champagne. You said somebody paid for this, right? And that's all you needed. You just had to prove that out. And then you were ready to go. And it probably energized you for the next lab, which w- leg, which was how do we make it smooth or better or grow it? And, you know, that's 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 what I got right now. What would you add? No, I mean, that's 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 awesome. I wish at the end of every meeting I got a summary of 
of uh, <laughs> of what I said. So uh, I think there's an AI out there that probably maybe, does that, maybe. you know. But it's just gives that'll, you that'll be our next startup. Maybe uh, there you go. No, that was no, that was awesome. Uh, so no, nothing to nothing to add. I think that's a a great summary. And I'm I, you know I I love to talk Caltech. I love to talk startups. So I'm glad that we were able to get at the intersection there. What it's like to to be a founder and and build something that people actually want. Same. I could do it all day, but we are out of time and I appreciate you so much and love what you guys are doing. Keep going, keep going. Uh, you ever want to talk about radiology stuff, give me a shout and we can, you know, I'm, I'm happy to just riff on this all day long. So look, it was great to, to have you on the show. We really appreciate it. And uh, best of luck to you and your brother. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Jacob Fleming, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon. With support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Louis Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 